Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner, and I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And we are delighted to welcome you here this afternoon and to be here for this briefing that we are holding in partnership with the Union of Concerned Scientists. It's a very important topic that we are addressing this afternoon, and I think that as we have looked at the attention that's been focused with regard to climate change and the, the release of the National Climate Assessment uh, just a couple of weeks ago, that this new report that is being released by the Union of Concerned Scientists is a very, very important time for us to really take stock of what is at stake and what are the kinds of impacts that we are facing. And obviously, as we think about this topic in terms of thinking about national landmarks at risk, it is a very moving and important thing for us to consider since these national landmarks are symbols. They are very important in terms of our understanding as Americans of our history, of things that are very important in terms of our cultural heritage. And that, I think, is going to be extremely telling as we listen to our speakers this afternoon as they look at some of the sites that are at risk as we have learned more and more about the impacts that we are already seeing. With that said, I am delighted to turn to Senator Martin Heinrich, who is going to open up our briefing this afternoon. And we feel especially honored to have him here because New Mexico is a very, very special place and is home to wonderful natural resources that are treasured by all Americans. It's also home to many of our very important national historic landmarks. And Senator Heinrich brings a very special background and passion to the Senate and to his concern about all of this. He, before coming to the Senate very recently and where he serves on the Energy and Natural Resources uh, Committee as well as on the Intelligence and Joint Economic Committee, before that he was in the House of Representatives and prior to that he has experience stemming from working in the private sector as well as working with nonprofits as well as very important leadership coming out of local government, which positions him very, very well for work at the national leadership level. He also has another very special reason to be passionate with regard to think about the preservation and caring for our national landmarks, and that is he's got two little boys, and that's what the future is all about. Senator Heinrich. Thank you all, and it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today uh, to talk about an incredibly important subject. And as you heard, New Mexico is a land of incredible natural resources, but we are who we are because you cannot separate those natural resources from our history and our cultural resources. And it's why this facet of the impacts of climate change are uh, so resonant and so important to be discussed. Um, I want to give you just a little bit of a window into what we're experiencing in, in New Mexico, and then you're going to get to hear from this panel, not, a, not just about New Mexico, but about places all over the country and how this impact is uh, happening in very different ways in different parts of the country. How many of you have ever been in the middle of a forest fire? Forest fire is not something new to the state of New Mexico in the Southwest. It was very much a part of our ecology um, and very much a part of cultural reality in uh, New Mexico for hundreds and really thousands of years. Uh, and for a very long time, um, there were fires, oftentimes, that were not like the fires that we're seeing today. Um, I remember being in the midst of the Gila National Forest about 15 years ago in a forest fire um, that behaved like they used to behave, uh, where you see the fire burn 
uh, the brush and the grass along the ground and literally leave the overstory, and especially in the Ponderosa Pine region, uh, really just cleaned out the bottom of the forest and left the structure of the forest behind. It was a very healthy and natural cycle. In the last 20 years, I have seen marked changes in our, our weather, uh, our precipitation patterns and uh, temperature and even wind events that have driven a fire pattern that is very, very different. Um, two of the largest fires in New Mexico's history, the single two biggest, are within the last five years. And more than the size of those fires, that concerns me is the intensity of these new fires. Uh, we are seeing fires burn down slope in the middle of winter sometimes, uh, behave in ways that we've never seen before on such a wide basis. And that leaves a very different impact on the ground. And you're going to get to hear that from uh, my friend, former Governor Dashino from Santa Clara Pueblo. But having been an outfitter guide and worked uh, taking people into Bandelier National Monument, I can tell you that historically these fires were not particularly problematic for archaeological resources. But when you have a fire where every stick is removed, where the uh, the soil is basically vitrified. And then you follow that with a precipitation pattern that now, last year we had normal amounts of precipitation in New Mexico, but it all came in two events in July and September. That combination has the potential and has already begun to wipe archaeological sites literally off the map uh, in a way that is very troubling for a state that cares deeply about its identity and its cultural connection to the land. And that's just one state. Um, think about all of the states that have uh, shoreline and what it's already meaning to see the kind of, uh, see the kind of um, inundation that we are beginning to experience in our coastal states. And you begin to get a sense for the potential for climate change not just to be a natural resource and an economic problem, but a, a problem that threatens our history and by virtue of that, our identity as to who we are. And I think that's something we should take very seriously and uh, I thank you for being a part of this today to have that discussion. Thank you very, very much, Senator. And I think that we all look forward to working with Senator Heinrich on these issues um, in, the, in the Senate in the coming years. We are now going to turn to Adam Markham, who is the Director of Climate Impacts with the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, to set the stage for what is in this new report and its overall significance. And uh, Adam has been active and heavily involved in the study of climate and looking for solutions for many, many years. And I'm privileged to say that we, our history goes back quite a few years together. Uh, so Adam. Thank you. Well, I don't have much to say because I think uh, Senator Heinrich uh, said so much of what I'm here today to talk about so very well. Um, so we're, we're heading into Memorial Day this weekend, and so that means that millions of Americans are certainly starting to plan and think about their summer vacations. And, and millions of them are going to go to national parks, to historic districts, and to the places where American history was made. And what our report is about that we're launching today, um, National Landmarks at Risk, is how so many of those places are being impacted right now by climate change. Uh, the impacts will get worse in the future. The risks are growing. The vulnerability is greater. But what our report tries to show is what's happening already uh, around the country. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, we have um, 
in the report done 17 case studies, and we've outlined impacts in about 30 sites. They range from uh, very old archaeological sites from 10,000 or more years ago, where the first Americans entered the continent across the Bering Land Bridge, through to colonial sites like Jamestown, which is at risk of uh, serious inundation from sea level rise, uh, through to historic aviation, aeronautics, and space sites, some of the NASA sites, particularly on the eastern Gulf Coast. So it ranges the whole span of American history and prehistory, and we'll have speakers that are going to talk more about that today. The climate impacts that we're focused on are some of the ones that many people will have heard of from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report recently, international climate impacts, and just in the last few weeks, the National Climate Assessment, which was the most comprehensive assessment of climate impacts in the US um, that we've yet seen. And what we see coming out of those reports is a great deal of information on the climate, but actually neither of those reports has a dedicated section on historic sites or cultural resources. And that's the gap that we're trying to fill here today. Uh, the impacts that we're looking at in particular is sea level rise, which has risen about eight inches over the last century on a global basis, but in parts of the US, particularly on the East Coast. It's rising much faster than that. Some of the fastest rates of sea level rise in the world, in fact, are happening on the U.S. East Coast, particularly north of Cape Hatteras. Sea level rise brings worsening coastal erosion, and it also brings worse uh, coastal floods, particularly at high tides, when those tides are higher because of sea level rise. So we're seeing more flood threat. We also have seen an increase in extreme precipitation, so our heavy rainfall events are getting heavier, and that's particularly noticeable in the Northeast, but it's also, you can see that across the country, it's much, that trend is much stronger in the Northeast. And also, uh, North Atlantic storms are getting stronger. The increased energy uh, from the heat is making those storms stronger. So we see more storm damage. And then as Senator Heinrich talked about in the West, there's a very strong trend over the last 40 years because of uh, warming and drying to see uh, larger wildfires. And so this is one of the things we're going to talk about with regard to archaeological sites, these larger wildfires and a longer wildfire season, more than two months longer for the large wildfire season in the western states. And climate change is the, the primary driving factor behind that change in western fire regimes, which I think what's been interesting for me is we've researched this report and we've talked to dozens of people in, in the localities. We've talked about many, many people from the National Park Service who are involved in assessing and managing and trying to protect these resources at the local level. What's been remarkable is to see how quickly things are changing. We started working on this um, in the early, about this time last year, I suppose, and so we knew about the large wildfires in New Mexico, but it wasn't until September last year that these massive flash floods occurred in parts of the Rockies, and particularly we've seen the damage that happened in New Mexico from the floods, and you're going to hear a lot more about that, but the National Weather Service says that the floods were at least thousand-year floods, which means means, you know, every year you've got a one in a thousand chance of having a flood like that. And for some of these sites, I think Anna will talk about it, they, they may not have experienced floods uh, coming after fires of that magnitude during the time when there was habitation in some of these sites. So it's been quite shocking, really, to see the damage. Um, the, we've do, done 17 case studies. Probably for every case study that we did, we could have done another 20 places. This really is just the tip of the iceberg. And so for us, this is a, a way into the issue to try and understand what's happening to our historic sites, to historic districts in, in historic, dis, um, historic downtowns and to archaeological sites. And I think there's much more to come. The people that we have here today are going to talk about that. And we're not just talking about old archaeological sites or historic sites. We're also talking about living cultures. And the governor from Santa Clara Pueblo is going to talk a little bit about uh, the threats to their community, a community that is rooted in thousands of years of um, of local culture, and I think it's very important to remember that these are, we're not just talking about places whose 
the past is in the past, as they say. The past is also with us in everything that we, we do today, and I think that's a very important thing to remember. And so the final thing I would say is, what are we actually going to do about this? I mean, this is a major problem. It's getting worse. We have two choices. We can uh, try to slow down global warming impacts, reduce the rate of change, and that will, will help us to uh, mitigate the impacts. But we also have to bring resources into communities to reduce uh, the damage that is done in the future. And so we need to reduce heat trapping gases, and we need to uh, make make adaptation and preparedness a national priority and bring resources where they're needed. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. And I must say, a lot of this also, um, in terms of thinking about wildfires, uh, et cetera, has extreme budget impacts, and that's clearly an issue as the Congress deals with appropriations and as the Park Service and the Forest Service look at what's been happening with regard to their ability to deal with fires and uh, prevention, let alone uh, fire, any kind of fire control. We will now turn to Dr. Jeffrey Alshul, who is the president of the Society for American Archaeology. And as Adam also mentioned, as we think about all of these archaeological sites that are at risk, along with other cultural heritage sites, I think that it is really remarkable that so many of these sites are so very old that are now at risk, that they have survived so long and now they are at risk, and that has all happened in a very, very short period of time. Dr. Alchil. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Alchil, and I'm the current president of the Society for American Archaeology. And on behalf of the Society, I want to thank Senator Heinrich and the Union of Concerned Scientists for allowing us to participate in the press conference. As many of the other speakers here today will discuss, climate change is eroding and will continue to erode our historic fabric, disturbing and destroying many archaeological, traditional, and historic sites that embody the values we cherish as a nation. I want to speak less about specific sites than about two related topics, the management of historic sites and the importance of archaeology in facing climate change. In the United States, we fight the destruction of historic and cultural properties one at a time. A road, a well pad, commercial development is proposed, we identify what's in the way, and we figure out what to do. Unless we change course, we will fight the effects of climate change the same. Because climate change will affect resources at different times and in different places, it will be politically attractive to take a save our lighthouse approach. Uh, since each action is limited in scope and the resources needed are manageable. We will go to heroic lengths to save historic New Orleans or the New Jersey shore after hurricanes, spend a fortune on seawalls to protect protect a lighthouse, or commit vast resources to restore traditional grasslands or forests in the wake of, of fires. Over time, this strategy will be prohibitively expensive and end up saving lots of sites of interest to small vocal groups that may be of dubious value to the American people. It's time to engage in a different conversation. What do we want to save? What sites embody the core cultural values that will diminish us as a nation if we lose them? And what are we willing to let go? Much of the climate change debate seems to rest on an assumption that if we could stop it, all would be well in the world. Is that true? Is there anything in the past that might help us? I think so. Humans have been adapting to climate change as long as there have been humans. Archaeology, the only science that studies the full range of human history, is full of examples of what to do and what not to do. For example, I often hear that there will be winners and losers as climate becomes warmer and drier. 
Really? The last time the world heated up one to five degrees was during the Alta Thermal, or about 9,000 to 5,000 years ago. And in the area I study, the western US, you have to search far and wide to find any winners. But are bands of hunters and gatherers really good models for our modern society? Probably not. My guess is that it was far easier for hunters and gatherers to adapt to the hot and dry climate of the Alta Thermal. They simply moved to areas that could sustain them. We aren't so lucky. With seven billion people on the planet, there are few places to go that aren't already occupied. Civilization and state level societies are relatively recent phenomena, not much more than five to 6,000 years old. These are the most complicated and complex social forms of the most complicated species on the planet. It is little wonder that they hold such fascination for us. And even though we don't understand them well, certain patterns appear to hold when faced with potential catastrophic environmental change. First, there's a focus on improving technology, such as irrigation or modifying plants and animals. It is though each civilization believes they can think their way out of the problem. Second, there's really very little change in the fundamental relationship between members of societies. Those in power are loath to change a system that has worked so well for them. So are we that different? We are willing to spend countless sums on improving technology, but next to nothing on how we relate to each other. Much like four-wheel drive, our current technology-based strategy will allow us to continue down the road only to get stuck farther from a place from where we can extricate ourselves. Can we adapt to a hot, hotter and drier climatic regime? I think so. But if we are to do so, it will not be through a technology-only strategy. We are social animals. And if history and social sciences teach us anything, it is that there are many ways humans can relate to each other. Our task is to find those that will work. Archaeology can help in this regard, but only if archaeological sites are available to study. Thank you. Jeff, thank you so much for that very thoughtful outline of what really is at stake. We're now going to take a look at some of what's happening on the ground, so to speak. And we will first hear from Dr. Anastasia Stefan, who's an archeologist with Valle Caldera National Preserve in New Mexico. Anna. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today about what we're seeing throughout the Southwest with a landscape wildland fires. In the past two decades, Western parks and forests have experienced of forest fires burning larger with greater severity and more frequently than we've seen before throughout the 20th century or the centuries before. The Union of Concerned Scientists report details the devastating effects found at two parks, Mesa Verde National Park and Bandelier National Monument. Let's see. Oh. At Mesa Verde in southwestern Colorado, four large fires, four, four, sorry, four large wildfires have burned more than half of the park between 1996 and 2003. Hundreds of significant archaeological sites were directly affected by these hot fires causing damage to prehistoric pueblos and farming terraces and transforming places of importance to numerous Native American groups. Um, additional damage can be caused by the firefighting itself, as was staining from the bright red slurry that's dropped from aircraft in an attempt to save the pueblos from the flames. Bandelier National Monument I'm nervous about that screen because I can't see it very well. Bandler National Monument is located in the Jemez Mountains of north central New Mexico, right next door to the Valles Caldera National Preserve where I work. Bandler has burned three times in the last two decades, most recently with the, in 2011 with the Las Conchas fire. More than 50% of the park is now burned, 
with impacts to more than 1,000 archaeological sites, including ancestral Puebloan ruins and other smaller stone field houses where farmers in the where farmers in the 7th through 7th, 16th centuries tended their fields. It's worth taking a moment to look more closely at the to look more closely at the 2011 Las Conchas fire. At 156,000 acres, it was at the time the largest fire in New Mexico history, and Senator, the senator talked about this a moment ago. Um, it started when a small tree fell on a power line, and it moved so fast that there was nothing that could be done to slow the spread or to stop the fire. Um, in the first 14 hours, it burned 43,000 acres. That's a rate of about one acre every 1.17 seconds. Or to get an idea of the scale, that's a football field every two, uh, two seconds. Um, the fire evacuated the town of Los Alamos. It threatened the national labs there and burned over 3,000 archaeological sites across several agencies at Bandelier, across the Santa Fe National Forest, um, Valles Caldera National Preserve, and Santa Clara Pueblo. By every measure, Los Conchas was the worst, the worst case scenario for fire effects to cultural resources. Damage was unprecedented see, because um, it burned so large and so hot. Ancestral Puebloan ruins were left without protective vegetation, with building stones cracked and flaking, um, undermining standing walls that had withstood centuries of normal fires before. The scale and damage to the landscape is profound. 45% of the fire burned with moderate or high severity, meaning that most or all the trees were killed across large contiguous areas. Impacts to the soils and watershed are so significant that regional scientists anticipate that with the current long-term drought conditions, there's a very real possibility that pine forests will never return to these landscapes and be replaced instead with shrublands and juniper. In, south, in the southwest, let me go back here. In the southwest, as, as the senator said before, the fire season in May and June is followed by the rainy season in July and August. In fire-scarred landscapes, the heavy rains that come down don't soak into the ground, instead quickly move across the surface and create massive and destructive floods in the canyons. Governor Dachino will be speaking about the devastation on Santa Clara lands. At Bandelier, the floods in 2011 and 2013 are the worst in their 100-year history threatening the visitor center, washing out bridges, and closing several popular trails. In the adjacent Valles Caldera National Preserve, 60% of the preserve has burned in two fires in the last four years. Um, the, um, now we're dealing with the post-fire erosion, and the, we're finding that there are trenches being cut down. Some of them are 20 feet wide, 15 feet deep. And below those trenches are vast boulder fields strewn with cobbles along the base of hill slopes. What we're seeing washed away or being covered up forever are sites that, that chronicle America's prehistoric hunter-gatherers for the last 10,000 years. I know that when I watch an archaeological site, say that's 4,000 years old, wash away after having remained intact for all that time, I can't help but recognizing, recognize that what we're seeing today are changing climate conditions happening in real time. When the fires are burning, they cause park closures for several weeks at a time, disrupting vacation plans and damaging the economy in surrounding communities. They, they deflect staff from our regularly scheduled work, and they cost millions of dollars in suppression and emergency fire rehab right after the fire. The Los Conchas fire alone cost $45 million. So what can we do to cope with this changing face of fires in the Southwest? One thing is we can protect specific sites by removing fuels from them, but there are thousands of sites. Another is to develop tools to help archaeologists work better with fire managers to develop prescribed burns that will have the least amount of damage. These are some of the goals of an interagency project I'm working on with my colleagues called ArcBurn. It's funded by the Joint Fire Science Program, which supports scientific research on wild, wildland fires and distributes research to, results to policymakers and fire managers to make sound science-based decisions. Perhaps the most, the most important and effective thing we can do right now is to understand the scale of this problem and work to decrease the size and severity of landscape fires. This is the goal of 
the Collaborative Forage Landscape Restoration Program, which was created in Congress to enable landscape scale ecosystem restoration. It allows, it helps um, federal agencies work together across federal lines and um, to develop projects that will minimize extreme fire behavior and limit the size of fires once they're underway. Partnerships also include tribal governments and non-government organizations like the Nature Conservancy. And they are done in coordination with industry to um, create opportunities for com commercial use of forest materials to offset the federal costs of rehabilitation and re restoration and to benefit local rural communities. As we consider the case studies detailed in this report, it's clear that the parks, forests, landmarks, and preserves are places worth protecting. Archaeological sites are, are non-renewable resources. They're precious to the American public, and our shared heritage gives added meaning to the natural landmarks and destinations that we explore and treasure. Forest fires are a healthy part of southwestern forests, but the large landscape scale fires that, we're, that are burning now are outside the normal historic range. They're bigger, hotter, and more damaging. So thank you all as we work together to find solutions to these challenges. And I think, Anna, what is really so striking in terms of what you were saying is that in terms of dealing with the scale of this, recognizing, learning, and then pulling, having to pull together so many different people uh, locally, different kinds of agencies at local, state, and national level to try and figure out how to best problem solve so that we can do as well as what we can in, in terms of trying to hold on to these to these sites and, and to preserve them for our common future. To tell the story of the Santa Clara Pueblo, we are so pleased to have with us Walter Dash Dashno, the former governor of Santa Clara Pueblo. As we say in our language, I, I am one of the owners of the um, initial bandolier area. And so you have a living example of what life was then, what it's like today, and, and what it will be like for all of us in the future. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Walter Dashno, the former governor for the Pueblo of Santa Clara. Pueblo. Today I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Governor Joseph Michael Chavarria, who is unable to be here to present um, our issue. He sends his greetings to all of you today. And along with me today is our counsel, Tara Hoska, who is here to answer any questions that we may have in the future um, regarding this matter. Additionally, I'd like to also thank the Honorable Senator Heinrich, Mr. Markham, Mr. Edisol, Ms. Stephan, Ms. Craig, Mr. Spears, and all of you that are interested to hear our conversation this afternoon. I think it's a little bit more than a conversation. What I see is those of you that have concerns with what climate um, change is going to be and what it will be like in the future. On the afternoon of June 26, 2011, I was sitting in my office wondering what we were going to do with the fire that had just started that afternoon. I was at a, a baptism for one of our relatives and a little smoke um, was occurring on the bandolier area approximately 1.32 o'clock. We uh, immediately went home and informed some of our tribal staff that we have to be concerned with what we see because of, of the fear that we saw that was going to potentially happen. We had experienced this similar conditions with the uh, 
fire that occurred called the Cerro Grande fire in the year 2000. Conditions that were strong with the winds, very, very dry, so much so that the precipitation was lower than what you would buy with people that were buying um, lumber in a lumber yard. There's a song that says, and was sung by a group called Earth, Wind, and Fire. Well, there are two things that needed to be added to that song. It's now rain and flooding. As owners of our lands, as we take care of Mother Issue, Mother Earth, as we say, we've gone through an experience that I hope many of you never will go through. Forest fires that we have that occurred on our reservation, and you'll see, uh, I'm sorry, I can't see the, the slide either, but it shows you, the first few slides will show you what the, uh, our original lands look like in, the, in our area. With a pristine, beautiful area where you could go hunting, fishing. Green trees, hunters, fishermen, green grasses, tall trees, tall mountains. And then this occurred. So you can see the major difference with just the two slides. The plume was up towards 50 to 100,000 feet. And it covered all the way to uh, Kansas, I think it was. You can see it's like a bomb that occurs when it hits the lands. These are the after effects. No trees, no plants. The boulders that, are, that were up in the mountains are now in the lower stream bed area. Nothing to hold the vegetation. And then the aftermath with the flooding. So you can see the damage that happens. It impacted our community, which is approximately 10 miles east of the initial flooding. And the effect that it caused by the rains that happened. Some of the area, as you see it today, is no longer the same. So we'll be in this situation for the next 100, 200, 300 years. So that today, all of us that are here collectively ask your support in looking at the issue of climate change. Our people ask three things. One is that we seek immediate appropriations for our second dam project that doesn't require a cash match, noting that such investment is far less costly than the loss of life and property that could occur without such a structure. Additional appropriation to tribes like Santa Clara and other tribes to implement the, tip, the TIPA, or the Tribal Environmental Protection Act. And as governor, allow Santa Clara to perform hazardous fuels reduction projects so that we can save our last remaining green stance of timber and biological stronghold. And last, action to create a climate resiliency and recovery fund to support communities such as Santa Clara that are faced with devastating impacts of climate change. In closing, we are enclosing some documents that elaborate our issues and identify the impact through climate change. I'm sorry, five minutes is not long enough, but I think it gets our point across. So I hope that um, as you begin to hear more information, that you support it 100%, that those of, that are here today present to you the most important and dangerous situation that we'll face in the future of mankind. Because it's not a story, it's an actual events that are occurring. And it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. Uh, we see that in the southwest. You see that in the uh, Arctic area, in Antarctica. You see, the, see that in the rainforest. You see that on the east coast and the west coast. 
you saw what happened in um, Louisiana. And so it's no, no movie. This is real life. And so all of you, please um, take it to heed what information we're presenting to you and um, voice your concerns with your congressional delegation. Uh, voice your concerns and support President Obama and his administration. And also voice your concerns with your local chapters of um, Sierra Clubs and otherwise. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you very much, Walter. It, it really is very telling to when you hear a voice who is with his people have been going through these kinds of impacts and have seen the kind of devastation that is resulting, knowing that we have to figure out ways in which to try and um, address these kinds of impacts. Uh, uh, there is so much at stake in terms of human lives, human property, uh, human futures, and livelihoods, and being able to go forward. What does this mean for the future? And obviously, we all need to be aware of what is really happening in these places around the country that are enduring extremely severe impacts. Um, so it's very, very important to, to hear and learn um, some of these things that are really occurring, as Walter said, in very, very real time and that have to be addressed because people are dealing with them as we speak. So we will now turn to the other side of the country to Lisa Craig, who is the Chief of Historic Preservation in Annapolis, with another whole picture of what's at stake there. Lisa. Thank you, and good afternoon to you all. I want to thank the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists for helping us showcase our, showcase our local efforts to address climate change. I'll, I'd also like to thank colleagues in the room, in the room today. Um, uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation provided us the seed funding to start this project. Rhonda and Cabbage is here, as well as Eric Hine with the National Conference of State Preservation Officers. Uh, the State Preservation Office has provided us funding as well. So we are taking this into our own hands. And because I understand the slides are not that easy to view, you do have a packet. I'd encourage you to follow along in your packet. That's probably the easiest way to handle this. Um, as you heard, I am the Chief of Historic Preservation. I am also the Director of the Main Street Program. That is very important in our National Historic Landmark District because historic properties are the economic engine for the city of Annapolis. And that's why we are looking at this project, not only with the uh, uh, leadership of our, our city council and mayor, but with the business associations who believe this is important as well. Sea level rise is threatening Maryland's historic seaports. In Annapolis, we are partnering with many federal, state, and local agencies, nonprofit organizations, citizens, and businesses to see what we can do as a community to respond to that. We therefore are going to be using, and have started already, a model document that a lot of people don't know about, apparently. The Federal Emergency Management Association, after Katrina, produced this guide, Integrating Historic Property and Cultural Resource Considerations into Hazard Mitigation Planning. We're very proud to be one of the first ones, apparently, to re be using this document uh, from front to back cover. So we hope to have this project be a model, uh, certainly for others in the state of Maryland, but for also other historic seaport uh, and coastal communities around the country who want to know how you do it yourself as a local community. We realize that the control is in our hands. We're going to make a difference through our own local efforts. Um, Laid out in 1695, am I changing here? Yeah. Uh, Annapolis was one of the first planned cities based on a Baroque plan. It contains one of the most, uh, 
the largest and significant number of 18th century brick buildings in the country. The city's waterfront, which is frequently inundated, as a matter of fact, uh, three times in the last two weeks with nuisance flooding. I, I talked to a reporter yesterday and said, or day before yesterday, and said, gee, you, you should have called me. I was looking out my window and it was uh, flooding and they came the next day uh, and took the photo. But it was a beautiful day because we have a beautiful day in Annapolis every day. Uh, but the city's waterfront bustled with ships bringing visitors, immigrants, servants, and slaves. As a matter of fact, the Alex Haley Memorial has become the flood elevation marker for Annapolis. Uh, all four signers lived there. It was the um, location for the capital of the United States between 1783 and 1784. George Washington resigned his commission there. It's also home to the U.S. Naval Academy Go Navy. And we have commissioning week this week. So if you need to come to Annapolis this week, great place to come. Beautiful today, and uh, you'll enjoy the flyover. As a matter of fact, the Blue Angels were practicing when I left. Because sea level rise continue uh, in the Chesapeake, the so-called 100-year storm event, which is a severe event that happens with a 1% of chance occurring in any given year, um, we will see flooding. As a matter of fact, sea level rise in the Chesapeake could reach 17 to 28 inches above 1990 levels by 2095. Uh, in regards to the rest of the coast, 2050 is the best estimate for mean sea level rise at 1.4 inches and 2100 at 3.7. As part of the Maryland Climate Action Plan, sea rise studies have been conducted for lower eastern shore communities. In many communities, you abate, you protect, or you, or excuse me, you abandon, protect, or uh, relocate. Uh, given the importance of the historic district and the waterfront and the recreational and economic needs, we, we don't really have a chance. We are going to stay in place and protect what we have. Now, um, in Annapolis, the 100-year floodplain, which is an earlier slide, is at, slide, is at 7.8 feet, with high tide or nuisance flooding at 3.4 feet. Pretty much happens frequently at high tide. By 2050, it will be at 8.3 feet and um, rising. We have a history of hurricanes, the most recent of which was Isabel. Uh, initially a Category 4 hurricane, uh, storm surges reached more than 8 feet. There were 17 deaths across uh, the Chesapeake region and more than $3 billion in damage. It caused disastrous flooding in our historic city dock area, damaging buildings, and it took a decade for our own market house to come back online again. It was a huge economic impact to Annapolis. So now we have a city dock master plan. That is what is underway. Um, we have major uh, landmarks at risk, uh, early 19th century tobacco warehouse, Middleton Tavern, which is where uh, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson traveled by ferry across the bay, and the Sands House. It's always those little houses, that little tiny one in the right-hand corner, 1739, one of the earliest frame structures uh, in the region, and it is definitely threatened um, by uh, coastal flooding. Uh, we are, as I said, using the FEMA guidance. It's laid out very clearly. Our partners have funded this project, and as I'd mentioned earlier, the National Trust, Preservation Maryland is another organization, uh, the Maryland Historical Trust, our State Preservation Office, which I would encourage many communities to talk to because this is a model project that others will want to follow up on. And even more importantly, coming to us uh, most recently, the Army Corps of Engineers, who has its own flood mitiga mitigation team, they have volunteered uh, their time and effort, $60,000 worth of work, to help our community assess the risk and to respond. Risk assessment in the community is underway to just give you a representative idea of how much this will cost our community. We did, looked at 11 representative buildings of the 180 or so that is in the floodplain area. It totaled $23,879,000 of potential displacement, loss of building, loss of use to our local economy. That's over $1.9 million per building. It's a big deal for Annapolis. 
So our mitigation strategies are going to be in the hands of property owners. We're going to, after we complete the assessment, give them the tools they need, develop a design guideline, tell them how to do it, and incentivize them to do it through uh, tax credits. We do have a tax credit program, a local property tax credit, and if you uh, complete uh, mitigation strategies, you get a 25% property tax credit. So to wrap up here, I'd just like to say that um, as Adam had said earlier, the past is with us. It's very much with us. I was at a public hearing last night where someone came in and talked about readiness uh, and emergency management. And one of the comments that he made was the local community is responsible for their bu business resiliency. That's how we look at it in Annapolis. Our resilient historic district has been around for three centuries. We intend it will be here for the next three centuries. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lisa. And obviously, as we've heard from several people, the economics of what we're dealing with with impacts is profound. And I think what's so important in terms of what you were also talking about, in terms of thinking about so many coastal cities, the history that's involved, how important it is for people to be able to learn from and to help each other so we don't have to have so much reinventing the wheel, but instead can move forward by by really learning and from what others are doing. Our final speaker this afternoon, it, before we open it up for discussion and your questions, is Ellen Spears, who is the historian and director of cultural resources with the National Parks Conservation Association. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Alan Spears uh, from the National Parks Conservation Association, and uh, for over 90 years, NPCA has been the leading voice of the American people on behalf of their national parks. And you can find out more about who we are and what we do by visiting our website at www.npca.org. I'm honored to join my colleagues from the Union of Concerned Scientists and other organizations here today, and grateful uh, to Senator Martin Heinrich for kicking off this event. Uh, to share our concerns about the adverse impacts of climate change and corresponding sea level rise on lands managed by the National Park Service generally, and the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Monument on Maryland's eastern shore, and Fort Monroe National Monument at Hampton Roads, Virginia, uh, in particular. The voices of our ancestors speak to us from these places. Fort Monroe marks the site where African slavery began in Virginia in 1619, when Dutch sailors traded 20 and odd Africans to English settled on Point Comfort Peninsula. It also marks the beginning of the long overdue demise of the peculiar institution in the Commonwealth, when in May of 1861, Union General Ben Butler issued his contraband decision uh, refusing to return three enslaved African-American men to their, ans uh, to their owner. Uh, in the wake of Butler's contraband decision, nearly 10,000 more enslaved men and women made that perilous journey from slavery to freedom at, Fe at Freedom's Fortress, seeking their liberty. The Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Monument preserves much of the landscape that Harriet Tubman knew and traversed as a young enslaved woman and later as one of the most successful conductors on the Underground Railroad. Many of the roads, woods, canals, and waterways Tubman knew intimately and used to liberate both kin and strangers alike remain a, a part of this remarkably historic and intact landscape. The preservation of these unique resources began with long and hard-fought citizen-led campaigns and culminated in the decision by President Barack Obama to designate national monuments in 2011 for Fort Monroe and 2013 for Harriet Tubman under his authority via the Antiquities Act. These new parks are already helping the public gain a much more inclusive and accurate understanding of American history and the African-American experience in this country, and they're adding much needed diversity to our national park system. Experts contend, however, that within a few generations, both of these sites may be covered by rising seas. The degradation or loss of these sites due to the impacts of climate change must not be allowed to happen. By virtue of the sites they manage and the stories the agency interprets and protects, 
The National Park Service is one of the largest stewards of African American history in the country. NPCA is committed to ensuring that NPS has the funding, staffing, programs, and support in place to continue capably managing and protecting the nation's natural, cultural, historic, scenic, and recreational resources well into its second century. So let's stop the adverse impacts of climate change on public lands so that we can ensure that our children's children will be able to enjoy Harriet Tubman and Fort Monroe National Monuments in perpetuity and unimpaired by human-made disaster. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alan. And one of the things I also found staggering was in terms of learning that the National Park Service in its analysis had found that 96% of the areas, the properties um, on, on its watch um, are sh already showing observed changes of climate change over the course of the last 100 years, uh, which is a very, very profound impact. And I think that as we've heard from all of the speakers today, our history, our landmarks through our parks are so important to our history, to our understanding that history, um, to being able to share that with everyone throughout our societies, to people who are living in these places, who are seeing their own livelihoods, their own way of life being threatened, and now the need to figure out how best do we deal with all of this. So um, I want now to open it up for your questions and comments, and I also just wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Brenda Eckwitzel, who is here in the front row, and she is the senior climate scientist with the Union of Concerned Scientists. So if there are any particular science questions related to this, uh, she is available to answer them. And again, as Adam pointed out, the report is, I think, is so important, but, but it is the tip of the iceberg and is a snapshot of, of 17 case studies, about 30 at-risk sites, and these are just some of the many, many places around the country uh, that are affected. Any questions for our panel? Okay. And if you could identify yourself, please. Hi, I'm, I'm Henry Gass from ClimateWire. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, you talked about um, deciding what to save essentially in, in some situations. And I was just wondering, is there any precedent for that kind of decision being made with cultural resources? Do you know, have any idea sort of how those decisions might be made in the future? Because um, they almost certainly will, will have to be made. I'll, I'll try to start with this, but um, you know, uh, the areas affected by climate change the most have been in the northern latitude so far. And uh, Scotland has had a particularly uh, difficult time. They have a lot of coastal settlements, a lot of castles near the shore. And they had to make a decision early on about which ones to save and which ones not to. And so they have, uh, so there are models, particularly uh, in, in Europe, where they have gone through that difficult uh, decision-making process and have decided to let things go. There are only so many things you can move, particularly monumental architecture or uh, buildings, particularly hundreds or thousands year old buildings. Uh, so that's, uh, to my mind, that, that's one of the better examples. I know that, that internationally it, it, it is much more of a driving issue than thus far in the United States. I mean, was it based on economics or engineering of it? Or? No, I don't, uh, well, I think that's part of it, but I think that, that, you know, so much of cultural heritage is a consultative process that I, I don't know this exactly, but but, you know, English heritage, Scottish heritage, those are na quasi-national organizations. Uh, I'm sure they had lots of, uh, of public input about what's going to work and what isn't. Uh, I'm sure that's how we would do it in this country. Lisa, do you want to talk? 
Well, yes. Uh, I think there's several people. That <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead. Uh, so uh, a couple things there. When we talk about potentially winners and losers and a list and who gets in the lifeboat and who doesn't, so to speak, um, we want to work with the National Park Service to be able to help the agency come up with a plan that maybe revisits the way that they normally protect and preserve their resources. And as I understand that the large policy right now is to protect in place. With the increase in very intense fires and flooding, that may no longer be possible or pragmatic. And so the agency is going to have to consider what they're going to be able to remove and provide safe storage for elsewhere off-site, which is something that uh, I think they have been reluctant to do for very good reasons up until now. I think it's also important to talk about, because we're getting into an era of establishing national monuments and national parks that are partnership parks and lived-in communities. So at Fort Monroe, you've got that historic fort. You've also got the Old Point Comfort Peninsula, and we're considering future use plans there that could involve significant development. And the question is, is do we want to start putting places or houses, homes, office buildings in places that could be in jeopardy from rising sea levels, as opposed to leaving the peninsula largely undeveloped and intact in the north of the fort, where it can essentially naturally deal with the impacts of rising sea levels. So that's something that all of us are going to have to consider as we move forward. Um, and then sometimes nature just wins. If you go to Yorktown Final Victory, which is a National Park Service site, the famous readout number 10, um, as what, that was a part of that siege in the Battle of Yorktown, has already collapsed largely into the river. So um, we're looking at some things that we can't save because they're already gone. And I think the idea is to look forward and see what can be preserved. I think Alan's right. First off, and it was said earlier, you have to document everything because you aren't going to be able to save everything. So that's been the, the first uh, tool we've used that came out of the FEMA guidance. But it, it's interesting because FEMA also developed what they call a worksheet for determining community value. So we use the standards of the profession. Uh, is it a National Register listed building? Does it have national significance? Uh, did George Washington sleep there, dine there? whatever the case may be. But the reality is, is these places mean something to the community. And so we actually have an outreach tool as part of our process to identify, uh, yes, Middleton's Tavern uh, may have been significant at some point because of who uh, uh, dined there. But the reality is, is the community goes there all the time. It's a landmark that sits on a main on main kind of corner. And if it was gone or threatened or FEMA was red tagging, that would be the building that the community would say, you got to save it no matter what, even if we have to rebuild it. So um, you do need to look to your community and then help get their input on evaluating what is important to them because that's how uh, historic preservation is successful in Annapolis. At least as, at least as far as tribal governments, one of the things that we're, we're concerned with is uh, where do funds come and where do we go after some of these funds? Obviously, uh, because of the uh, situation with Congress, uh, we have to see uh, where the uh, uh, funding sources are, sometimes with the state, sometimes with tribal funds or otherwise. So in our situation, um, there is a trust responsibility of the federal government that has to be adhered to. And so we definitely are going to be uh, seeking those kinds of resources when it becomes available. The second part to this whole issue is where small communities uh, as are many small communities across the United States. And obviously, uh, if you don't have plans available, it definitely impacts your area. So those of you that can do it collectively as, um, as um, partners, um, I suggest that you do that because resources just are not available um, anywhere because of what's occurring. The last thing is, um, with all of those things that are are happening now, uh, the, the report that came out with uh, the Union of Scientists, um, it's important for all of you to read that document. That way you can also get some ideas on where you could go to, to seek uh, support on some of these issues. And again, I, I definitely encourage you to contact your congressional delegation and 
you talk to them and see what they might be able to do because there's funds that um, should become available. We're taxpayers and we should get the funding. Thank you. And it's important for policymakers to even just be aware of what is happening in a lot of these localities. Anna. I think I can support um, what the other speakers have said, and that is that there needs to be a, a dialogue among historic preservationists, historians, archaeologists, and academia, and in federal land management, and at lower state and lower government levels. Um, to identify the the scale of response, but I, I, I would really like to um, repeat what Governor Dashino says. I, I think it's very important that for individual people to speak up about the places that they value and the places that they're concerned about. Um, if nothing else, it can get across that everybody cares about some place and it's important for us to all start speaking to each other about what how we're going to go into the future together. Okay, question. Hi, uh, well that first question was a great one and it was exactly mine, but <laughs> I, I, so uh, I have living here, I, I think there's a second really big question which you all have just kind of segued into which is how to pay for it. Um, and uh, I'm sure the report has some ideas, but um, oh, I'm Chris Mann with the Pew Charitable Trust, by the way. Um, what are your thoughts on, on how we pay for this finance mechanisms? I'm struck by Lisa's comment that the cost per house is going to be $1.9 million. It's going to be a long time before 25% tax credits get there, although I certainly applaud that kind of an effort, but financing. Is this, is this on? It was on. Now it's on? No. OK. Now it's on. OK. Um, so, you know, there's kind of an obvious answer to that question, and it's an answer that we're not going to get right now. The carbon price, right? We, we need to generate revenue to pay for some of the impacts that are already happening and for, as I said before, hopefully a national priority on resilience and preparedness and adaptation. And one way to do that is to Re generate revenue through pricing carbon in some way. I'm not saying which way that should be, but if we are, that ends up in helping us to reduce emissions, which reduces the rate of change, and it also provides revenue for a variety of things, one of which could be a national resilience and preparedness fund. So I think, you know, that to me is the simplest answer, but I think there are obviously a lot of other sort of uh, perhaps state level and local level answers to that, and maybe uh, I know that there's some things that are being done in Annapolis where they're looking at incentives for local property owners, and maybe Maybe you'd want to talk well, about to, that. Well, to, to clarify it, you, you want me to come up? I think okay. it's easier for the <coughs> camera, too. I think you have to look at the other side as well. It's the cost of not doing anything. The $1.9 million per property. We'll see what we get with that number at the end of our, our survey. But, uh, you know, we were dealing with properties that, uh, in that 11, group of 11, ranging from $163,000 up to $8.9 million for loss and replacement of the building, the loss and uh, replacement of the business, the displacement, the additional rent somewhere that has to be paid uh, to have a new use, uh, the infrastructure, all of those issues roll up into that number. So that is the cost of not doing something, period. The cost of doing something can be very small at an individual property level. It can be doing door dams or window dams. You could be talking about an investment of, you know, as little as ten thousand, five to ten thousand dollars for a small property to something much larger, obviously, a public infrastructure of a seawall, for example. That's where you get hung up at the local community level. When you are cutting budgets, you're trying to keep police and fire departments on board, yet at, and public safety and emergency management, which was our discussion last night. Um, you kind of look at the seawall and an investment of you know tens of millions of dollars, depending on where you are, as something you just can't see 
doing right now in the short term. And I think that's where we're all coming from. We have to look at this as a long-term solution. We do have city tax credits. There are state tax credits and so forth. I think each state has to be creative if, if climate action response is going to be um, a priority for them. They're going to have to be creative at the local and state level. Just a, just a brief comment to that. Um, the way we fund historic preservation in this country is largely project by project. You, you have a proponent. It's a polluter pays model. So a proponent of an action is responsible for meeting conditions, writing a compliance report, something. So they pay for it. Uh, but there's nothing in the National Historic Preservation Act that requires it. And so in the West in particular, we have gone to a number of programmatic approaches where, in particular, oil and gas, <clears throat> where you can bank the money from each well pad or pipeline and create a, a fund by which then is distributed by those stakeholders to those things that are most important to them. And I think at the end of the day, when you ask how are we going to fund it, it will be by creating those kinds of funds that are outside of individual projects. Because I, I, I think we're all getting to the point that individually they're just, you know, some communities may have the money to do it, but many won't. And, and uh, we're going to have to look at a fundamental change in how we pay for historic preservation in the country. And it sounds like that discussion is now getting underway and certainly needs to. Um, other questions, comments? OK, over here. Hi, I'm Joanne Ivancic with Advanced Biofuels USA. And, and I wanted to sort of build on what Alan was saying. It's, it's great to hear you say that we should be recognizing what's going to happen before we start making it worse. Um, and maybe zoning might be part of the way to do that. I think the thing is making, and, and part of the answer to that, making the markets really recognize the impact of, of climate change. Uh, I think Governor O'Malley said that they're not going to build any public buildings within the 100-year flood zone. And, and that should be reflected in, in private investment, too. And so coming from the Bio, advanced biofuels, I'd say also look at these now as we're getting more marginal lands as the sea levels rise and looking at that as how it can still have value, how can it still have economic value, how can it still have agricultural value in making, in growing things that couldn't grow there before. Um, so it might be part of the answer to that, but I think that what Alan was talking about, I'd, I'd like you to expand on that if you could, on how do you see us not building office buildings and and stuff like that where we know that they're going we're going to be paying for them somehow uh, to mitigate the damage that we're we're putting in place. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so the challenge at Fort Monroe is it being a partnership park with the National Park Service and the Fort Monroe Authority is how do we make it a, a financially viable going concern so that people are attracted to this fantastic story and this fantastic resource, but also that it helps to generate money because, as folks are aware, the budget for the National Park Service is not as robust as we would like for it to be. And so I think as we work through the planning process, the Fort Monroe Authority, the National Park Service, Commonwealth of Virginia all coming together, they're trying to figure out what the right mix is of land use and development north of the Ford area, heading up the northern portion of the Old Point Comfort Peninsula. But in doing that, I think it can't simply be an economic decision that's made there. We have to take into account the evidence related to climate change and rising sea levels and the extent to which it's possible or not to protect that entire peninsula from rising sea levels. Now, in the lower area where Fort Monroe is in the historic district, we've got berms that are in place and measures that are de taking, being um, 
uh, input now to make sure that there are protections against rising sea levels. I'm not sure you can do that for the entire peninsula, and so people have to understand, as we go forward with future use planning, what we can protect and what we can pro cannot protect, so that we're not setting up people in harm's way, essentially. Um, there are other sites. Harry Tubman Underground Railroad National Monument is a slightly different concern. Some of the, uh, there's not really much in the way of development there. There's a lot of private property that's within the boundary of the National Monument. Um, the private property owners there will do what they want with their private property. There will be a visitor center constructed by the state of Maryland uh, to honor Harriet Tubman and commemorate her legacy. And then the Jacob Jackson home site is the 480 acre part that's owned by the National Park Service. It's furthest to the west and closest to the water and most likely to be threatened by rising sea levels. Currently, there's no extant building marking Jacob Jackson's home site. Um, so maybe the decision there is to put in an, an interpretive marker or some sort of design that does not rebuild the structure. Uh, but there are ways, I think, to think creatively and innovatively about that to make sure that we don't get ourselves in more trouble than we might be in now. Thanks, Alan. Uh, any other comments or questions? Okay, are there, I just wanted to ask our panel if there were, okay, one question over here. Um, yeah, sorry, this is um, just a quick question for, for Lise Craig. Um, could you give me some more specifics on this FEMA plan that it seems very mysterious and I haven't heard anything about it before? Um, the guidance that FEMA developed uh, really has four approaches to it. You have to identify your resources first and organize around uh, uh, protecting them and engaging the public to do the same. Then you have to sur survey from a point of view of their risk. How vulnerable are they? And it's not just sea level rise, it's fire. It's whatever it is that is the hazard that is within your community. We heard about fire. Uh, earthquakes, you know, we had one in Maryland recently. Um, so you have to identify those vulnerabilities. Then you have to assess each resource against that. Can it be replaced? Would it be devastated and it would be irreplaceable? What's the contents of the property? Um, and uh, uh, what is the value to the community? What's the economic value, the underlying tourism, the heritage travel value? Um, and then the community value, you assess all that. And then the last component is developing the plan for implementation, both for a short term and long term, individual property to major public investment. And then most importantly, the last step of that is implementing it. Implementation is part of the plan. It is not a plan meant to sit on a shelf. And so that is what we are working to. We are in Annapolis in phase two of the planning effort, doing both public outreach as well as survey work um, before we move into development of what we are calling the Cultural Resource Hazard Mitigation Plan, which will be an amendment to our comprehensive plan and an amendment to the state of, or to our city of Annapolis uh, uh, hazard, all hazard mitigation or natural hazard mitigation plan. <clears throat> Great. Thanks so much. One last question. Okay. Um, again, on, on the Annapolis question, can you see in, say, the, the hundred years of that plan, it being more like um, Harper's Ferry, where everything that is there as a going business is not there anymore, it's just a historic site, and then you sort of move everything to high ground whenever the flood comes through? Um. We don't look at Annapolis that way. We have a number of major cultural institutions, historic Annapolis, uh, the Banneker Douglas Museum, the State House, the state. We are a living, breathing capital. So uh, we don't look at ourselves as uh, a series of um, house museums. We love our National Park Service and Harriet Tubman's site and other surrounding areas. Um, but the Naval Academy, which is our other national historic landmark, which is right there, right there, uh, uh, hence why we would both have to agree to have a seawall, and that's another uh, uh, hard push. So um, we're li living, breathing community, and our historic properties are important, but you know they change. Uh, we allow uh, improvements to properties. We allow new construction uh, where it makes sense is inappropriate, um, but uh, you know we, we don't really look at ourselves as um, 
a series of house museums. Tourism is four million people to our community every year though, and that is important to us, and we have a lot of local businesses that depend on it. So um, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Thanks. And, and I must say, tourism is important to all of these sites. And of course, that means it's an, a, a very important economically. But the tourism is really important in terms of sharing those American experiences, the heritage, a better understanding of, of our history. So I hope that everyone reads um, the UCS report. And, uh, and also share it with friends and colleagues. Uh, it's really important that we really have a much more robust dialogue, learn much more about all of this, and what are the best ways for our communities to be able to adapt, uh, to find ways to preserve these very important uh, cultural and historic uh, uh, landmarks for, for our country. And, if you go to our website at www.eesi.org, you will find the images from today and the video there so that you'll be able to see it in all of the grand color which it was originally intended to show. Uh, so I want to thank very much the Union of Concerned Scientists for putting together this wonderful, very timely and compelling report and bringing that to all of our attention. And I want to thank these wonderful panelists today who can really speak about what this really means in site after site as we really look at what is at stake and the kinds of impacts that we are seeing. Thank you all very, very much for being here.